Today's lecture uh, is special uh, in several ways. Primarily because, uh, in a way, this lecture is one of the clear demonstrations of what it means to uh, study a global history of architecture. Um, our, our friend and founder of the course, Mark Yarzenbeck, uh, gave a presentation, a very provocative presentation at the Nick Center last Friday at Harvard. And um, he was quite passionate in reminding us all about what we're supposed to be doing. And his critique of this type of a course, uh, or the, what is passing for a global history of architecture, is really the old Eurocentric uh, white man's world history of architecture, plus plus Chinese, plus African, plus Mesoamerican, plus plus plus, and he points out that this approach, the whole ends up being much less than the sum of its parts. It's simply a Eurocentric view, augmented by uh, these nation-centric views that really obliterate as much or more than they reveal. And this lecture is a clear demonstration of the benefits of avoiding that. Normally, the four topics we're looking at today uh, would be looked at as Russian history and Chinese history, and again Russian history in a way, because uh, Samarkand spent an awful long time recently as part of the Soviet Union. So what a bizarre distortion of the reality uh, instead, what we get to do is look at how this one man, this peasant, this nobody from nowhere, who was part of a nothing society, he was from one of those first society tribal unga bunga groups that we like to just ignore in courses like this. He was a Mongol. We ignore people like them because they're nomadic, they're pastoral, they don't build cities. The Mongols did not build cities. They live in tents. They travel by horse. The genius uh, and the success of their uh, project is that they tamed horses 6,000 years ago so they could eat them. 4,000 years ago, they said, hey, we can ride these things. So they became incredibly mobile and powerful, skilled warriors. All males were trained from birth to shoot a bow and arrow at full gallop. Uh, they were fierce warriors. They carried their architecture on the backs of their horses, and they set them up wherever they went. Even as they conquered whole realms, they set up their capital city as a tent city. How crazy is that? So this is an example of one of those first society peoples that we've referred to that uh, most, most of the time we ignore in courses like this. But they had such a tremendous impact on the world uh, it was the largest empire in human history in terms of land area. Genghis Khan himself, this nobody from nowhere, uh, and proper pronunciation of his name is Genghis, but I'll say Genghis just because we're used to that. Um, this nobody from nowhere didn't just conquer the largest uh, empire in human history, more than Alexander, who we'll talk about, more than anybody. He did it in 25 years. Uh, he, uh, he did it with uh, some of the most brutal campaigns in human history. Uh, he didn't just kill as many people as he could in many of the places he went. He also fathered as many children as he possibly could. And he was so successful at that. And he told his children, do the same. Kill everyone you can. Save some women so they can bury your sons. Recent research has unearthed the fact that uh, one out of 200 humans is related to Genghis Khan. And this was, he started this project 900 years ago. That was like yesterday. Unbelievable impact genetically. Uh, and did he leave great architecture? Nothing. Nothing. Not a trace. But uh, part of the success was the flexibility of the approach. He was willing to do whatever it takes to be successful. If it means embracing Islam, okay, I'll do that. If it means embracing Christianity, 
willing to do that too. If it means uh, adopting uh, Chinese customs of building capitals, okay, we'll do that. We can do that. So here he started from this area, uh, conquering it, uh, killed his half-brother at the age of 10, and from there he just kept going. And uh, uh, 1223, 1227, those were a good four years. Uh, and I don't like colored maps, shapes on maps, as you know, but at least this one is moving. At least this one is dynamic. It doesn't pretend that there's this kind of nation-state thing. Um, these modern lines are just for reference. So he's conquered all of China. He's taken on Korea. And look how far west he goes, deep into Europe. Europeans were terrified of this guy for a good reason. Uh, and so we're going to look at four places where he left a deep impression through this creative destruction um, that we've referred to. And here are some of the empires he left. For some reason, um, we don't get the Mughal Empire uh, so much yet because um, our map doesn't go that way. Oh, there's a map. Okay. So go over there. I have to turn. Yes. Yes. Are there? Maybe Alex, you can. Who doesn't have today's number? Okay. Um, so here we go over to China. So uh, the Song Dynasty was in disarray despite the brilliance of their inventions. They're the ones who gave us uh, gunpowder and paper and so many other things. But they were uh, ripe for takeover. And so Genghis Khan um, struck deep, uh, heading east. And this is not a depiction of Beijing, his capital at Beijing. But it was something like this. And I'm careful not to zoom in too far. Basically, these are yurts. They, are, they use that baby gate um, pantogram structure in a circle. It basically folds up, and you can put it on the side of a horse. Uh, and you cover that with felt. I think the next image gives us the interior. You cover that with felt, and you, uh, you move around. These were pastoral peoples. They did not depend on agriculture. They depend, depended on moving a lot. Um, Genghis Khan, being the flexible, pragmatic man that he was, said, OK, I'm ruling these peoples, these uh, Chinese, these Han Chinese, ethnic Han Chinese. I'm going to build a complex of buildings so that they feel comfortable. I'm going to adapt whatever works. I'm going to adapt to their structure, and I'm going to make the capital kind of a hybrid thing. I don't want to be in a, in a permanent building that's kind of primitive. I'm going to stay in the, the yurt. But these administrators, they need to do their thing in buildings. And so this was the first, uh, the first capital of Beijing was something like this, uh, that with this north-south axis. Many of the features in keeping with the Chinese practices that we're going to be looking at today and in future weeks uh, were, were all embedded in, um, in uh, this capital uh, that really was set up um, by Kublai Khan. How many people are watching the Marco Polo thing? I heard it flopped like crazy. Did it flop? Really poor. Even though it's supposed to be really good. I know, I didn't like it. I'm just fascinated by the history. I just love that. I'm sorry to hear that. Okay. Well, I hope you get a chance to see it um, at some point. So the Chinese, uh, uh, so the Mongols uh, did all this creative destruction thing, killing lots and lots of people and having lots of babies. And they left uh, the, the, the area, the, the, the legacy uh, came in multiple forms. One is, it, w it really devastated these civilizations for many decades and centuries uh, to the point where it allowed the Mediterranean world that we talked about last week to thrive in competition. Um, that that in, in comparison, the Mediterranean world uh, that uh, the Mongols spared, uh, many historians feel that they didn't have to spare. They could have marched on Vienna. They could have marched on Paris. They could have taken the British Isles. There was no stopping the Mongols. Um, and, uh, it, and 
but they left, they left this comparative advantage in the Mediterranean world. They spared Cairo, they spared Constantinople, uh, and so it allowed those places to thrive relatively. Uh, the other thing they did is um, they uh, cleared the ground for other empires to thrive. And uh, so uh, the Ming Chinese came and they were able to conquer back the ethnic Han, were able to conquer back their territories uh, from the weakening uh, rulers left by the Mongols. Uh, and during this period, there was an attempt to reestablish the majesty of China, of Ming China. They rebuilt the capital. Uh, so our first site is the Forbidden City in Beijing. This is really when the Forbidden City gets built, 1420, about two centuries after the conquest uh, and the first capital, the Mongol capital uh, of the Yuan Dynasty, the Mongol Yuan Dynasty of China. Uh, they, Fades and Ming take over. They build uh, Beijing, the Forbidden City, according to traditional principles of Chinese uh, order, uh, which we're going to look at in detail. And they strike out across uh, the South China Sea through this uh, spice trading territory controlled by the Muslims. And they, um, the purpose of, of Zheng Ha, which is how you really pronounce it, I'm told, uh, the Zheng Ha's voyage in the, in the 15th century, uh, as I mentioned in the Portuguese lecture, they kind of uh, covered a similar territory, and the contrast is telling. The Portuguese were going for money and souls. The Chinese were going for prestige. They were, this was an ambassador trip. It was to impress everyone they went. To, uh, it was in order to establish trade connections, but not for the things that they could gain from the trade, not for what the Chinese could gain in terms of material uh, benefits. They were trying to establish prestige. They knew these other people wanted to trade with China. Why not? China was the single biggest source of uh, made, uh, produced things. Uh, they were the consumer giants of the era. Uh, and they wanted, if you wanted to trade with us in China, you have to get on my ship, which itself was pretty impressive. Come on the ship, bring some gifts, and we'll take you back to Beijing. You can come into the Forbidden City and bang your head against the floor in front of the Almighty Emperor to kowtow. This is the kowtow. Uh, you physically bang your head on the floor and uh, signify the prestige of the Emperor. This is what it was all about. And if you think back to our previous lectures about China, there's an interesting resonance to the importance that prestige plays, the uh, travesty of the humiliations that occurred uh, when the Europeans came, the Opium War, uh, even the communist era, era and the present uh, aggressive uh, attempt to really build the, the nation in terms of a player on the world. Uh, it really, uh, scholarship is increasingly pointing back to these roots of how important it is. So here we have Zheng Ha's uh, trade mission, um, bringing back animals from Africa, setting up a zoo. Um, we have an interesting little side note is that uh, the bubonic plague uh, emerges uh, inland in Asia, comes, uh, moves, I think I have a better map. No, I don't. But it moves through the trade network and devastates Europe. Uh, somewhere between one-third and a half of the population of Europe is, uh, it dies in this uh, attack of the bubonic plague. Uh, in Venice, we talked about how important trade uh, with the East was in Venice. Fifty of the noble families uh, of Venice simply disappeared. Uh, Venice was particularly hard hit. So here we are at our first piece of architecture, uh, the, Supreme, the Hall of Supreme Harmony in the Forbidden City of Beijing. And this is at the center of a very complex um, hierarchy of space. Uh, these concentric rings of power. 
that's not it. So it's raised up, uh, and um, that there was this, this, this is where the throne room is of the emperor. Now, the whole point of Chinese authority uh, that we'll talk about in future weeks as we move back in time is that the emperor's job is to earn the mandate of heaven, earn and hold it. And the way you earn and hold the mandate of heaven is you are a wise and good administrator of the empire, of the realm. And you do it by guiding your administrators to be effective. And so this is a bureaucracy. This is a worship of the bureaucracy. Uh, and if you know anything about Confucianism, you know that Confucianism focuses on people playing the proper role. And that's what this was all about. And that's what the architecture reflects. And so uh, this extremely ordered world, uh, starting at the center, where power sits on the throne, and it is through that ordered uh, bureaucracy, the effective administration of the realm, that the mandate of heaven is, is held and reinforced through the daily rituals. And this is an interesting, it contrasts with the other examples we're looking at today and in the course, but it also resonates with things like the Taj Mahal, which we'll get to. Um, and so here we have uh, the inner core of the administrative center. This is where uh, the, audience, the audiences would uh, occur uh, in the, the Hall of Supreme Harmony. Raised up, the, uh, the power is projected out in a pattern that covers the entire territory. At the same time, these series of gates and courtyards and walls are there to protect the power. And so it strikes an order across the territory, and it also protects it at the center of the Forbidden City. The other thing that happens is by raising it up, the emperor looks out across the territory and has a privileged point of view, a lot like we saw at the Alhambra. Uh, here's a wedding in the, uh, in the 19th century where the order, uh, each the places, the positions where each of these figures is standing is crucial to maintaining the order of the realm. And so it'd be very carefully choreographed. Here we see the Hall of Supreme Harmony on the right, and um, these are the supporting uh, audience halls. This is where people could come in from the outside. This is where um, uh, administrators of the different provinces could meet the emperor. And then here is where the ministers. And so it was uh, moving uh, northward uh, to the left, it would get more and more intimate. Uh, and here is the throne, uh, something that features in the movie The Last Emperor. And here's the, the section through it. And you start to see that every part of the architecture, and we'll get into this uh, in future topics, these brackets, there's a hierarchy of order where each of these brackets uh, plays a role in the symbolic uh, designation of order. So it's an ordering hierarchy. Everything has its place up to and including the architectural elements, uh, which is similar to what we saw in Java. Uh, and we see here... Um, there, is, there are building codes that dictate who can have what kind of building, what kind of roof form can you have, and how many of these guys can you have on your ridge lines. And so uh, all of these, this cascading of symbols, each one has its own meaning, each one signifies a different character trait that is important for the emperor to withhold, uh, to uphold, uh, in order to continuously earn the mandate of heaven. Uh, and so now we start to move out and see this hierarchy. There's the Hall of Supreme Harmony at the center, the other audience halls moving to the north towards the rear, the private quarters of the emperor and the royal family. Uh, up here, it's the gate to the hall, uh, to the courtyard of Supreme Harmony. Uh, the, the role of water, you see the sacred lake and this canal, this is the Golden Canal, and it the whole complex follows, as you might expect, the rules of feng shui. So feng shui has, has come up previously with the Bank of China example uh, in Hong Kong and Shanghai. It is the, the feng shui is the, uh, 
practices of controlling the flow of good and evil fortune. And so water plays a crucial role. The cardinal directions play a crucial role. And we see, um, if you go through the list on the sheet, uh, north is associated with uh, a certain color. I should get one of those sheets. North is black. Um, it's cold. It's where the winds come from. It's where the attacks come from, the hordes from the north. Uh, we'll get to the Great Wall. Um, but each of the four cardinal directions is associated with a different set of characters and qualities. To the east is the Hall of the Ancestors. The sun rises in the east. This is where our ancestors, uh, this is where we emerge from. In the west, that's where the military barracks are. That's where death is. That's where regret and memory reside. And then to the south is uh, where um, the... The emperor looks south across the territory. Everyone approaching the emperor looks north. And that is carefully controlled. The kowtow, uh, which in a way is one of the most important moments of truth, organized by this, uh, this architecture. Uh, the kowtow occurs uh, to the south of the emperor. The person kowtowing is facing north. And so this is a carefully choreographed set of rituals that uh, the architecture is, in a way, the stage set that supports this, the operation of this entire hierarchy. The success of the emperor, and thus the maintenance of the mandate of heaven, depends on the operation of the bureaucracy organized right and left. The source of legacy is not the architecture. This is an exceptional thing. Uh, Chinese architecture does not create glorious monuments. This is a glorious monument as a secondary effect. The point is not to create a glorious monument. The glory of the emperor is recorded in the historical records maintained by the administrators. The architecture is a machine for maintaining order. Secondarily, it has this monumental aspect as well in order to function. So it's very different from uh, what we'll see at the um, Taj Mahal. So here you see the Golden Canal uh, flowing in front of the, uh, the gate that leads to the Hall of Supreme Harmony. So we're moving out, backing out southward. Um, so the gate of Supreme Harmony, the canal, the bridge over the canal, uh, this uh, imposing uh, gate uh, where the garrisons would protect. Even during the processions, this is uh, picture this being cut and, and relocated here. Uh, here we see the procession moving uh, through the sequence, um, crossing one canal through a gate into the courtyard, another gate, each one fortified with soldiers, the two garrisons right and left, east and west, uh, through this courtyard, over the Golden Canal, through the gate of the uh, uh, Supreme Harmony, and into this courtyard, where the Hall of Supreme Harmony is suppressed in this view. Moving northward, we get into uh, uh, the other uh, palaces. And so there's a series of multiple palaces in this extremely complex organization, uh, all for uh, fostering a serenity of mind, a serenity of thought, uh, to re realign to the purposes, the central purpose of the Chinese administration. Um, the floors were warmed in the, um, the hall devoted to the mental health, the cultivation of mental health um, of the emperor. Um, and the different roof forms that are dictated by specific building codes. So every neighborhood moving out from the palace itself, every neighborhood was organized in a similar way where there were building codes that dictated who of what status could have what kind of house, how high, what roof form, what degree of ornamentation. Uh, you see here that these elaborate roof forms uh, were structurally independent of the walls. Uh, much as we saw in Katsura Palace in Japan, these are elaborate uh, pillared structures with brackets, series of brackets that reach out to the deep overhanging eaves and varying degrees of complexity in the roof form that develop over the centuries. And the walls are free-floating independent partitions that do not hold up the roof. 
And the brackets, here's a sense of the complexity of the brackets. Like we saw in Java, every bracket would have a name that would simultaneously uh, refer to a structural architectural function and a spiritual uh, religious uh, meaning in the larger system. Um, similarly, with the doors, the colors all have symbolic uh, aspects to them. The, the ceiling panels, very elaborately decorated, uh, each beam. And so there's a very strong parallel between what we saw in Katsura, uh, Imperial Villa, and what we see in the Forbidden City, because these are really two branches of a single uh, tradition that we'll see. Um, moving quickly, uh, it's worth mentioning that uh, Joan Ha's journeys around the world were quickly cut short uh, when there was a change of emperor. And uh, uh, in 1433, uh, he's, his ships were docked and, and they stopped the journeys. And there was a turn to inward and uh, a, a matter of revisiting those defensive walls of the Great Wall of China that had started um, in the third century BCE uh, and renewed and extended by various um, dynasties. Here in the Ming, it wasn't a matter of absolutely controlling. It was a matter of slowing down uh, the opposition or the threatening hordes from the north. And uh, some scholars indicate that a more important function was to keep the Chinese population within uh, the realm. So it's similar. This wall, in a way, in that way, served a similar function as the walls around each of the neighborhoods that were there to control the population, to make sure that the census counts were, were properly uh, done, that military conscription, no one could escape military conscription. So the walls around each neighborhood were, in part, uh, an instrument of social control. And Going out to the Great Wall of China, a similar function is being performed, not just defensively, but also to control the population. It was also a, uh, a communication route where you could send signals from tower to tower and very quickly communicate. You could also travel across this otherwise impenetrable terrain. And so it wasn't just a defensive wall. It was all of these other things as well. Okay, this is where we would zoom back out. I have it in here somewhere. I'm sorry, I don't have my Google Earth. You like those Google Earth things? Um, I do too. So, any questions about the Forbidden City? I know it's a lot to take in. Okay. So, the primary uh, focus of the Mongols was. Uh, in Yuan, Mongol Yuan Dynasty China uh, that later was recaptured by the Ming, and this is what they built out of that. Another place that actually was much more directly, uh, continuously controlled by those of uh, Mongol legacy, of a Mongol inheritance, uh, Samarkand was a great capital of, uh, made extremely wealthy by the Silk Route. Uh, I'm not going to say Silk Road. Um, uh, it's more of a Silk Route because much of it was water-based. And the Silk Route, uh, the Silk Routes, are really a network of local uh, trade connections where um, the person receiving the silk um, in Samarkand never met the person who produced the silk. Uh, they only met someone a few hundred miles to the east. Uh, and so it's a chain of trade where it changes hands repeatedly. And we've been talking about the spice trade and how each time uh, the spices change hands, uh, there would be um, a markup in the price of the spices. And the Portuguese got filthy rich by uh, bypassing all those uh, middlemen. Uh, but if the market rate of uh, nutmeg was set uh, through this silk route, chain of markups, they would not uh, undercut the price. They would keep that price high. 
and instead of profiting you know that last five percent they profited the 95 percent of all the markups uh, just skipping all those markups so they'd get the spices for five dollars and sell it for uh, for a hundred dollars uh, and and pocket all that so here we are back in the world where of markups and Samarkand uh, was at the hub of that because it was surrounded by desert and hostile terrain, uh, but uh, positioned along a river, it was quite a fertile uh, belt, so it was very uh, conducive to the Karavanserai, which we mentioned uh, in Istanbul. Karavanserai trade, uh, in that word Karavanserai, is the word caravan. And Sarai is kind of the network of hostels, uh, hotels, motels, uh, as it were, that uh, hosts, that allows that trade to occur. And so it's a network of caravans of camels. Camels are the miraculous ships of the desert that carry uh, far more than horses or oxen, and they can go nine days without water. Uh, and so the capacity uh, of these camels was the key to uh, the success of this trade. The Mongols came uh, in the 13th century and wiped out uh, everything, Samarkand included. Um, by this point, um, the great Mongol uh, general was Timur, uh, also known as Tamerlane. And he is the focal point and the founder of the Timurid dynasty that uh, continued to, uh, in an unbroken line of rulers, uh, sometimes controlling vast areas and sometimes broken up into smaller emirates, um, uh, up until the 1857 uh, Sepoy Revolution revolt against the British in India that we talked about in the Calcutta uh, lecture. Um, and so Timur is the one who establishes and rebuilds Samarkand. And as he moves out and conquers territories far and wide, uh, he kills everyone uh, in the great Mongol tradition unless they have some artistic skill, uh, and including craftsmen, building craftsmen, and architects. And so he builds Samarkand around this location of Registan Square. And the first thing uh, that gets built here is, of course, um, a mosque, a great mosque, a funeral uh, complex um, for rulers that really operates in a way similar to the Suleimanie mosque complex that we looked at in Istanbul last week. Uh, but the focal point of us here, um, and we see the, the role of pilgrimage. This is not Samarkand, but this is the kind of uh, hustle and bustle that would form around uh, the complexes of the mosques uh, and the schools. So the big deal with Samarkand that really defines it is the uh, Timur's, uh, the Tamerlane's uh, descendant, Ulu Beg, builds a school, a madrasa. And this is a school not just for the study of Islamic texts, but for the study of scholarship, uh, both in Islamic studies, but also uh, the Islamic tradition of the sciences and the mathematics. And a series of quite famous successful scholars come out of this. And so the other buildings of the Registan Square get built in the subsequent centuries because this is the famous capital of profound learning and science. And so here we see the first of the buildings, uh, 1417 Ulugh Beg Madrasa on Registan Square. Uh, it's been uh, destroyed and rebuilt multiple times, so uh, everything you see here is to be taken with a grain of salt, not least of which under the Soviet uh, UNESCO uh, project to reconstruct Registan Square um, in the 80s. And so here you see it all polished up. Um, you see the, the inner courtyard of the school uh, where you have classrooms and dormitories organized around this uh, two-story courtyard, all looking into the garden, into the, um, the courtyard. This is the great achievement uh, for which Ulug Beg's um, madrasa complex in Samarkand is known for. 
he builds this enormous observatory. And using this observatory, uh, and I think there's some actual dimensions, 36 meters high, um, with a slit at the top, it allows one to observe the position of the stars uh, with extreme accuracy. And so through years of painstaking research, uh, the, the team, under Ulug Beg's direct uh, uh, direction, uh, comes up with this guide, the, the Zai Sultani, uh, of almost 1,000 stars, uh, very precisely located through uh, the precision of this, uh, this scientific architectural uh, three-story, or no, multi uh, actually it's much higher than that, 36. So 11-story structure, um, quite high, uh, rendering, giving it such a high precision that the, uh, the scientific achievement isn't surpassed until much later in the West. And all of the astronomers of the West uh, of later centuries are all dependent on Islamic scientific uh, research and, and the, in the libraries uh, that came previously. And so this is um, still celebrated today. That here's uh, the only section I could find of this observatory to show how it works uh, was on this stamp. But it, this is the um, simultaneously kind of how the architecture of this observatory works and the importance of it in, uh, as a cultural legacy, celebrating um, this achievement. So here we see there's a whole bunch of um, black and white photographs from just before the Great Earthquake of 1897 and just after. And so you see um, all of these buildings are, are shaken and twisted and um, uh, damaged. Uh, like we saw in the Alhambra and Suleimani Mosque, there is this rich ornamental tradition that is crucial to uh, the uh, Islamic faith and the continuation and celebration, proper, proper observation of the greatness of Islam. Uh, and it's based in, uh, as we saw before, the, the denotation embedded in the architecture, uh, the Quranic scriptures that are embedded. We saw it first in the Hall of Wonders, the House of Wonders in Zanzibar, and we're going to continue to see it every time we stop in where Islam is a factor. Uh, we see uh, some great photographs in that uh, it's dark, and there's this shimmering light that comes through uh, the windows, and you get a sense of the evanescent quality of the shimmering that we talked about uh, in the Alhambra. And we start to get a sense of that uh, through some of the restored domes. These are cheap constructions. It's brick, it's uh, plaster, stucco plaster, and then um, very expensive elements are laid into it. Lapis stone, uh, gold leaf, uh, the blue is a, is, is, has a special role. It's the color of, of uh, mourning the dead. It's the color of water and wealth. Um, it is uh, used in doorways because blue is the color of defending against the evil eye. And so the, the Islamic tradition of blue doorways uh, is part of what we're seeing here. But the gold leaf, we see um, the... Uh, the transition, which is one of the things, that one of the great problems and opportunities of architecture, both in Christian architecture and in Islamic architecture, wherever you have a dome and you need to make a transition to a rectilinear plan, you have to reconcile these two geometries. You have to fit a, a round peg into a square hole. That's where these complex geometries come in the corners. In this case, in both cases, you, would, you might call it a pendentive or a squinch. Here, it's the squinch is done in a, uh, through the use of mukarnas. And mukarnas, as we remember from the Alhambra, just to reinforce things we've learned previously, are those inverted arches, those stalactite uh, ornamental elements of the dome. Let's look a little closer, I hope. A little closer. Um, where you get these complex geometries uh, that are reconciling 
there's, uh, in the squinches, the square and the round. Uh, the other buildings that get built around, here's Uleg Beg, uh, Uleg Beg's, uh, Uluk Beg's uh, Madrasa. It's so successful, they make a mirror image of it on this side, and then again on here, and it completes the, uh, the, the complex, um, and it becomes not just an important religious uh, and intellectual center, but um, there would normally be this is where uh, Friday prayers would, would occur, the all-important noon sermon uh, in his Islamic practice. Uh, but also um, the market would be here, no conflict between the market. Uh, and here's an odd uh, feature of this uh, architecture that is worth noting. It is the Shur Dor Madrasa, called the Lion's Gate, not so much a lion as it is a tiger. And it breaks the usual taboo of figurative representation in Islam. So it, it's significant, if only for that, um, of breaking that taboo. And we see this, we'll see this as we move forward on the other side of our Kremlin uh, unit here. Um, we'll see uh, the loosening up of the strictures uh, and the reinterpretation to permit figural art uh, in some Islamic traditions. Um, these ribbed domes really are one of the key features. And again, you see the Mukarnas inverted stalactite uh, here used in the inverse, a very interesting application of the Mukarnas. Very rich use of the mosaic tile. Uh, mosaic faience is the technique um, that we're going to see. Here's the mausoleum complex uh, that predates uh, the central um, the central Registan Square. And here you see the, the cenotaph of Timur himself. This is the largest block of, of jade ever discovered. It was broken during one of the hostile raids of the um, 18th, 17th century. And uh, the tombs of the great leaders would be below this. Um, quickly moving through this, um, this mosque was so ambitious that it really started to fall uh, as soon as it was built. Um, uh, but here you see this really beautiful uh, analytical drawing showing these ribbed, these, uh, these ribbed uh, dome elements. You see it in the plan section here. You see, um, well, you might not be able to see, but, um, but it's a very um, beautiful analysis of how these inverted mukarnas uh, elements, the hanging stalactite arches work. Here's the individual tiles in the, in the mosaic faience technique. You craft each tile individually, you color it, and then you fit it into place. It's an extremely complex geometry. Uh, how many of you um, in math class in high school or somewhere attempted to master the geometry of this mosaic technique? Did anyone do that? You did it? It's a really... Um, still, uh, with high-powered computers, people are still struggling with the analysis of these mosaic tile. How do you uh, create a perfect geometric order on these complex double curvature surfaces? It's non-Euclidean geometry, and it continues to um, entertain and baffle uh, mathematicians to the present. But it's just, uh, in a way, that is the moment of truth that joins these two worlds that we tend to think of in our contemporary perspective as being totally separate. There's religion over here and science over here. Just leave it alone. Well, as we looked at in the Alhambra, that's not, that doesn't work for everyone. That, uh, and, that, and in contradistinction, in this world, they are absolutely fused and integrated together. The science and the religion are absolutely unified, no conflict at all. And so the great uh, centers of scientific imagination and uh, development and progress of the Islamic world is one of the rich traditions. And to a large extent, uh, we'll see this um, when we look at the Cordoba uh, exchange um, in a few weeks. It's where we get our connection back to Greece and Rome uh, and the early thinkers. It's because it was preserved in the Islamic libraries, not because we have some special connection to Rome and Greece, it's because it came through these, uh, this tradition of, of Islam. 
So uh, restoration, uh, interminable restoration work um, uh, in Registan Square. Um, any questions about Samarkand? Okay. So the Mongols, we saw that they went all the way uh, deep into, uh, into Eastern Europe, and they conquered an area that had previously uh, been contested territory between the Slavs, the Slavic farming communities of the south, and uh, basically uh, Scandinavian Swedes. They didn't just go to Greenland and Canada and early on in their ocean-going ocean uh, longboats with dragons out the front. They also had these flat-bottomed boats that gave them access deep into the river networks of Eastern Europe, uh, making it down to Kiev, where um, uh, they, uh, the mythology, uh, it's hard to tell uh, increasingly in this course where the mythology ends and the actual factual reality of, uh, that we prefer in history um, where they where the line is between those two things but the mythology is that the Slavs invited quote unquote the Swedes to come in and rule them because they were fighting each other too much one way or another these ethnically Scandinavian peoples come down with their flat bottom boats they uh, make it past the cataracts by lifting and carrying the boats around the tough, unnavigable sections of the Dnieper River, and they make it to Kiev. And really, Kiev should be the capital of this whole story, but for various reasons that we won't go into, um, partly through the Mongol raids that come through here, it ends up being Moscow. Um, Kiev, Novgorod, and Moscow are the big contenders for this. Vladimir, uh, one of these Scandinavian warlords who are struggling to unite all the Slavic peoples, he uh, is a horrible person, um, behaves very badly, but uh, for the purposes of unifying his people, he decides, I think we need a religion. And this has occurred in various times and places, including uh, shortly previous to this moment, uh, where Vladimir is shopping for a religion, um, the Khazars are shopping for a religion, and they decide on Judaism. Well, uh, and so Vladimir invites these great scholars of Eastern Greek Orthodox Christianity from Constantinople. He invites uh, these figures from Western Roman Papal Christianity, uh, So, which are two, this is the big split in Christianity that precedes the Reformation. It's the East and Western Church, the Latin-speaking, Roman, uh, uh, Papal Christian Church versus the Greek-speaking, Orthodox, uh, Byzantium, Constantinople, Eastern branch of the franchise overseen by a patriarch. He's not a pape, he's a pa uh, pope, he's a patriarch. Um, and so that was the big split in Christianity, and those two are contenders. He's also uh, auditioning Judaism. He's auditioning Islam. He says, Islam, no, no drinking alcohol, you are out. Um, but the Christians are contenders. And um, when his ambassadors come back from uh, Constantinople, they say, oh, Hagia Sophia, this amazing church that we're going to look at, said, I didn't know, we didn't know if we were on earth or in heaven. It was so amazing. And so uh, this is the, the story behind Russian Orthodox Christianity taking hold um, on this part of the continent, this part of the world. And very soon after this, the patriarch of, uh, finally we get to the slide, the patriarch in Constantinople says, thank you for, for, your, for your choice. Here's an icon. And so the great, uh, famous, powerful, charged uh, icon of uh, the Vladimir Madonna is a gift from the Patriarch in Constantinople. Uh, it makes it uh, as far as the city of Vladimir, named after uh, the leader who uh, chose Eastern Orthodox Christianity. And this is an example of an icon that has tremendous power. 
when the, Mongol, when the Mongols attack uh, in the next century, this icon is the thing that is supposed to protect uh, the Rus, the people of uh, modern-day Russia. And uh, they, when the Mongols are descending on the city, uh, they take it away and they bring it as far as Moscow, where the icon uh, protects, protects the city of Moscow through its power. And so they build a church around this icon. And this is the church. It's the Cathedral of the Dormition uh, in the Moscow Kremlin. Now, Kremlin means fortress. We saw cit we've seen citadels in various cities on the hilltops. There's fortress, um, this city within a city um, where it's fortified, where the leaders are. The Kremlin, the word Kremlin means a citadel. It's that kind of a fortress th within the city walls. And so this is the location in Moscow at the, uh, the branch of the river, this important position strategically and spiritually. Uh, and this is where the church uh, is built. And it's a, it's a replica. It copies the earlier church in Vladimir where the icon had been kept. Uh, the center, there it has a five-dome dome system. It resonates with the Hindu uh, cosmology, but that's a coincidence. There's Jesus at the center, and then the four evangelists, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the authors of the Gospels of the New Testament. And so that's the, the Russian formula for the cathedral. It's a central cross plan church, which is what we associate with the Greek Orthodox uh, church. It's not the... It's not the elongated nave of the congregational churches that we looked at in Goa. It's the centralized church, and we could look at St. Peter's as well, the earlier idea of a centralized uh, plan by Bramante versus the longer plan that eventually gets built uh, at St. Peter's. So this is a worm's eye view, axonometric cutaway, and it's showing us um, the, the central dome and these, these heavy rectangular piers here, and these other columns that are uh, more slender than the Russian uh, version of this cathedral would be, the more grounded Russian one. The, the church, the version of the cathedral in Vladimir would be a much heavier, lower construction. Here, because um, here we are in 1475, what happens uh, prior to that? we get the fall of Constantinople. We get the shutting down of the eastern branch of Christianity. The Byzantium uh, Empire comes to an end, and the Ottoman Empire takes over, as we saw in the Suleimanian Mosque. That's in 1453. Uh, Christendom goes into chaos and panic. Uh, Venice keeps trading because business is business, but um, as untouched as the Mediterranean Christian world is, the Eastern Christian church is fraught with a crisis. So Ivan III, also known as Ivan the Great, his son is the terrible one. We'll get to him. So Ivan the Great uh, says, okay, Byzantium is over. Not so fast. We are the inheritors of Byzantium. We are the third Rome. Rome is the first Rome. Uh, Constantinople is the second Rome. It's the eastern branch of the Christian church. Now that that's controlled by the Ottomans, who's going to do it? I guess we'll do it. We have the icon, we have the cathedral, and so Ivan III constitutes Moscow with this church and other constructions to follow as the third Rome. And uh, appropriately, he says, we need a great architecture we need some architects from the Italian Renaissance. So they bring in um, Aristotele Fiora, uh, I'm not going to pronounce this right, I should at least look at it, Fioravanti. So he starts out as an architect for the Medici in Bologna and in Italy uh, uh, during the 15th century. He gets uh, invited to Hungary. The king of Hungary says, hey, why don't you come do some of that Italian renaissance -y thing here for me? Um, and then uh, Ivan III uh, 
goes to Hungary, sends ambassadors to Hungary, says, we need uh, goldsmiths, we need metal workers, we need craftsmen, and we need architects. And so they bring this team from Hungary, uh, this Italian team from Hungary, and they build, uh, they build all the buildings around Cathedral Square. And so you see what, uh, to a large extent, is the same, it's the same template of the Vladimir Cathedral of the 13th century, but here they elongate it. They give it Renaissance proportions. And they use Renaissance construction techniques instead of using a cantilevered vaulting system, which uh, some would call a corbeling system. If you go too far, the blocks fall, so don't go that far. And then load it up on top so that they don't tilt. That's kind of a clunky, awkward uh, uh, construction technique. The Renaissance uh, engineer slash architects have a much more elegant vaulting system, which involves the uh, creating trapezoidal blocks and the bricks, and they use lighter elements, and it becomes a much lighter, more delicate, more elegant um, uh, form, and that's what we're seeing here. So the big outline of the five domes is still uh, true to the Russian tradition, but we see it rendered in a, in a Renaissance, contemporary, higher, more sophisticated, lighter uh, structural approach. Now, one of the big things about this uh, cathedral is it becomes a machine for containing the different icons. And so, um, the, in the Eastern tradition uh, that takes hold in Russia at this time, it's very much about creating these spiritually charged, this is the secret to prosperity, to uh, winning battles, uh, is the control of these icons. And we'll see this in future weeks when we look at pilgrimage, the importance of icons. So here you see uh, the expression of the slender uh, columns on the exterior of the Dora Mission Cathedral, both in the doorways and in the exterior expression of the structure. And here you see it's a, it's a stage set, not so much like the Baroque uh, that we see later in Goa, but of these Byzantine-style uh, icons. So paintings take on a very important role. Um, and you see copies of the Madonna uh, icon here. Um, Ivan the Third um, has a son, Ivan the Fourth, and Ivan the Fourth is the terrible. And he's terrible because he does all kinds of stuff uh, to expand the empire. And one of the most important icons uh, embedded in this cathedral becomes this um, this uh, icon that depicts the Archangel Michael leading the forces uh, of uh, Ivan IV to conquer the territories. And uh, the martyrs who died, the souls of the martyrs, are greeted by the angels into the new Jerusalem of heaven with uh, the Virgin Mary and Jesus the baby uh, depicted here. And this is really uh, it's simultaneously a representation of the New Jerusalem of the Second Coming of Heaven, and also of the Moscow Kremlin itself. And so this is a depiction that justifies um, their fleeing, the, the pillaging of Kazan. Uh, and this is a way to boost the, the morale and spirit of the empire. And uh, in subsequent decades and centuries, the Cathedral Square uh, of the Kremlin fills up with the bell tower to Peter the Great. Uh, here's the Dormition Church Cathedral at the, the center. You have the uh, Renaissance palaces, palace with the diamond uh, facade. You get this uh, complex agglomeration. You get the reconstruction of the Kremlin itself. Um, here's um, comparing the two. Um, there's the diamond faceted palace. And then later you get this uh, exuberant, crazy, um, very Eastern Byzantine uh, tradition of flamboyance and expressiveness in St. Basil's Church, which is just too cool to not mention. Um, but, uh, well, it's um, the last point about this is that Russia, which starts out uh, as this collection, this networked uh, series of cities that eventually 
uh, are controlled via Moscow. Uh, in the next century, what happens is fur. There's a, there's a mini ice age, and uh, fur becomes highly prized. And we're not talking about this in North America. Instead of talking about how this happens in North America with all the French fur trade trappers uh, employing uh, the, the Americans in uh, fur trade, uh, we see a similar thing in Siberia, across uh, the Asia, uh, all the way to the Pacific Ocean. Um, Yermak uh, goes out, he sets up a series of fortresses, and over the course of the next uh, century or so, basically through smallpox, we've heard of that, and direct um, massacre, and deliberate genocide, something we don't have a big, well-documented history of, they take over the entire stretch of, of um, Siberia that's depicted here in this bar. Yeah. Um, but it's a very dark chapter. Uh, and the Kremlin lives on, the establishment of the Baroque uh, Parliament Hall and the palace. And so the Kremlin continues... Uh, in the post-Soviet era to be a center of government and a return of uh, religion as part of uh, Russian life. <clears throat> Any questions about the Kremlin of Moscow? Yes? What do you mean, like, dogs being the um, They are kind of crude masonry uh, that are then, you know, it's not, you can see how thick they are. It's not, the Onion Dome is not a structural form. So it's an example, it's more of a duck, because we've talked about Las Vegas already, I can say that, I hope, that the form itself is not generated by a structural logic. It's not like the duck, it's really different. It's a duck. Um, and then it's gold leaf uh, inside and then decorated uh, as well. Other questions? Okay. An abbreviated tour of uh, the Taj Mahal. So, skipping some of the background, um, except to say that the Mongols uh, from inland, uh, what we call China today, went east to Beijing, where they were subsequently replaced with the name. But when they go west, they pretty much hold on to a continuous lineage of rule to Samarkand, where Timur uh, establishes his inland empire. And uh, one of the sons of Timur goes south and establishes uh, the Mughal Empire. Mughal, Mongol. See that? See that resonance? Mughal is a variation of Mongol. So the Mughal Empire of India is a direct descendant from the Mongols. They embrace, because they're pragmatic Mongols uh, and flexible, they embrace Persian culture and language, Turkic uh, traditions of uh, language and culture. Uh, so it's the Turkic-Persian fusion under uh, Mongol leadership that generates the Timur uh, dynasty, the branch that moves south and established itself in Agra and Delhi and Dekka over the subsequent um, centuries. If you get a chance to take a course with Jim Westcote, he's the expert on this, um, and it's a fascinating culture. It's, is it Islam? Yes, but it's uh, a, a branch of Islam that is uh, remarkably uh, open to these aesthetic uh, uh, expressive uh, explorations, as we see in the Taj Mahal. Um, the great leader of Agra at this point is Shah Jahan. Shah Jahan is a deeply religious person. He is totally devoted. Uh, it's, it's very similar to the Chinese uh, approach in that he is totally focused on the ceremony of the day. He wakes at this time. He moves through this space along this path. And he makes an appearance at this window in front of his people. And at the appointed moment, he moves along this path and makes this appearance to his inner council. And the day is choreographed in this highly structured way. 
which is the crucial element that allows uh, the continuing uh, triumph and dominance of Shah Jahani rule. And it's choreographed by the architecture. Um, and his beloved wife dies at the age of 39, and he is devastated, and he, uh, for a time, relinquishes rule, uh, only to come back realizing he has to carry on. But now it's even more obsessive than ever before. And part of the obsession is uh, constructing the Taj Mahal with an absolute purity. The Taj Mahal is famous for being one of those places uh, of absolute total control. There are names of architects and craftspeople associated with the Taj Mahal, but it really boils down to Shah Jahan himself. He is there every day. He throws money and food at the craftspeople, urging them uh, to higher levels of uh, precision. Here you see in section, um, the focal point of the entire complex is the tomb of uh, Mumtaz Mahal, um, his departed wife. Um, so it's white marble brought from hundreds of kilometers away to the north, brought to this river site and crafted very carefully with the highest artisanry. Um, there's um, moving through the the uh, the list here of elements, the strict geometry of absolute symmetry, um, the bilateral symmetry, and I think I can see a bilateral symmetry to you guys, uh, your math background, but this bilateral symmetry that's called the Kirana um, Karina, uh, the perfect bilateral symmetry, uh, the strict hierarchy of form where elements are used very consistently throughout the complex. The colors white uh, are a Brahmic, uh, associated with the Brahmin, the top class of Indian uh, culture, and the reds of the Kshatriya class, the warriors, uh, the noble warriors. And so you move in a hierarchy from the center outward to the other elements, moving from white to red to other. Similarly, there is uh, a similar hierarchy expressed in uh, the decorative strategies of the tomb area, where the cenotaph and the screen around the tomb are all decorated with this highly realistic, naturalistic mosaic uh, and textile patterns in the floor and on the screens. And as one moves out towards the other elements, these natural decorative elements become more and more highly abstracted. Um, and so you move along this perfect by by uh, bilateral symmetry, or this moves into a, a, a single axis symmetry um, to the other buildings of the complex. The perfection of the gardens, the landscaping, again, as you would expect, like in the Alhambra uh, and at the Sulaimani Mosque, uh, you see an invocation of heaven on earth. The gardens, the role of water, um, all of these elements are in perfectly ordered geometries. Um, that are all part of maintaining the order of the society. Um, the sensual, uh, here we see the, the site um, sited on, on the river. Here's the fortress city of Agra, and we see the Taj Mahal. Uh, oh, let's look at it in this map. It's clear. So it's over here on the bend of the river. Um, Shah Jahan himself is buried across the river uh, on this side, uh, so he can view the glory of the Taj Mahal. Uh, here you see it's um, kind of a, a city. As it moves out here, there's caravanserai, there are uh, market elements. Uh, and as we move from the white, uh, realistic flowered uh, details of the center. We move out towards the red, and then we move out to the, the kind of the everyday commerce, commercial center. Um, here's uh, Humayun's tomb, which was the uh, predecessor of the Taj Mahal, uh, from which uh, this tradition grows. But this um, was one of the great achievements of its time, uh, but is far outperformed by the Taj Mahal. You see these elements, you recognize those little domes up there? Where have we seen those before? Where was that? 
It's the Indo-Saracenic of um, Edward Lutyen's viceroy's house in the British colonial capital of New Delhi. So it's very directly um, carried on in the Indo-Saracenic. So here you see some of the decorative details of the flowers of the inner cenotaph. Um, quickly moving to what happens. Um, Aurangzeb uh, takes over from Shah Jahan and uh, imposes this very strict Islam. And he wants to build, he wants to conquer. He's a very tyrannical ruler. Uh, he, he doesn't have the same approach. He taxes the people to the point of breaking their backs. Um, they hear about what? They hear about him in uh, Paris through uh, Aurangzeb's uh, private doctor is a Frenchman who uh, communicates back to Louis XIV's uh, court in Paris. And the stories are part of the influence of Versailles. So the great palace of Versailles, to a large extent, is influenced by uh, what Aurangzeb and the Mughal emperors of India are doing. And so um, it's just one of these interesting moments where you get this global transmission and uh, mutual influence uh, at a very early time. So any questions about this or any of the other topics? Yes. So when you first mentioned the idea of the Indo-Saracenic style with the Vice uh, you said it was potentially like an inappropriate use of, of that of motif or those styles because it was done sort of by the British colonial perspective on British Arcuria, actually, yeah. um, Aurangzeb's uh, tyrannical rule so weakens the empire, he's in such debt, that he leaves the whole thing vulnerable to the British East India Company coming in and just taking it. Oh, uh, yeah, I'm sorry. It's backwards, so it's yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you for asking, because we need to keep track of that. But it's, a, it's an important question. Everybody takes the material that, they're, that they inherit and they deploy it, they redeploy it, this is part of reproduce with difference, for their specific purposes. Shah Jahan is doing this, Aurangzeb is doing it, and the British are doing it. Uh, it's really power uh, using architectural form as an instrument for achieving uh, the goals of that moment. And it might be the British, it might be a Mughal Emperor. It's, it's all there. Anything else? Okay, thank you. Uh, use those office hours. <laughs>